Just to open up, I'd like to um, the issue of Aboriginal explorers. Now, the whole concept of Aboriginal explorers is, is <coughs> explorers is a European term, basically. And um, when we're thinking about, okay, Aboriginal explorers, well, it, it really doesn't fit. Because you've got to remember when, um, when, a, when someone goes out exploring, they're doing that as an individual. So James Cook, he explored and he discovered for himself alone the East Coast of New South Wales in April 1770. He discovered it. It had already been discovered. He wasn't the first to discover. So the whole, the whole um, concept of discovery, first discovery and exploration is, is kind of, it, it's a strange concept. When, we, when we're aware that um, Aboriginal people had been here in Australia for 60,000 years or more, so the whole idea, as we now know, of, of, of explorers and discovery is a strange, very strange concept. Because according to science, about 50,000 years ago, um, Aboriginal society civilization, maybe even 100,000 years ago, there's some archaeologists, I'm not an archaeologist, people arrived here in Australia, New Zealand, 1,500 years, Pacific, 30,000 years, quite recent there in, 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 um, in America as well. And when we're talking about 60, 80, 100,000 years ago, we've got to remember Australia was different. 25,000 years ago, the sea level was 85 metres lower than it is now. So a lot of, a lot of what was the Illawarra 25,000 years ago is out there under the water, um, a lot of the places where people live. So as, as, a, as, as a European, I, I'm not Aboriginal in any way. As a European, when I'm looking at this, I'm okay. What is the science telling us? It's telling us Aboriginal society has been here in Australia for 60,000 years or more. There's some archaeologists saying 100,000 years or more. So the fact is, Aboriginal society is one of the oldest societies on this planet. One of the oldest continuing societies on this planet. Australia is not a young country. Um, I won't get political, but Australia is not a young country. It's one of the oldest countries in the world, both in regards to the geography and in regards to the civilization. What I've just got here is some images um, from, 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 the, from, the, from the colonial period. So Australia's got is one of the oldest countries. It's got one of the oldest continuing living civilizations on this planet, 60 to 80 to 100,000 years old. And that's an important element we need to think about when we. When we raise the term Aboriginal explorers, which as I said earlier on is really a misnomer because we don't, with explorers, what do we have? We're talking about people setting out on a certain date in a, in a certain way, um, we doing a certain thing, such as Captain Cook or Arthur Phillip or, or, or Burke and Wills. We know the dates, they keep records, they keep times. With Aboriginal um, society, for us as, as non Aboriginal people, we're going, well, what have we got? Who was the first person here? When did it all start? What are the dates? What are the times? Where's the scientific Western evidence for all this? And we haven't got that because we haven't, Aboriginal civilization is very different to ours and it, it doesn't, it didn't have a calendar like ours. It doesn't record things like that. Nevertheless, within Aboriginal society are the stories, the, the records, but within Aboriginal society is the information about that. So, for example, one of the items on exhibition here is the Gang Men Gang story, which tells about <coughs> the arrival of Aboriginal people here in the Illawarra. Now, it's a totemic story. It talks about whales and, and starfish and all those sorts of things. So it's, it's not a historical document as such. It's not going to say, on this date, this Aboriginal person, this Aboriginal man, woman, child, or family did this certain thing. It's not like we're used to with Captain James Cook on this day did this certain thing. So it's all very different. So to tell the truth, the, the idea of having a, a talk called Aboriginal Explorers was basically to get Jay here to come and talk about <laughs> um, to come and talk about aspects of Aboriginal culture, Aboriginal history, some of those things. And um, so I this was just a bit of an introduction to say that you know, when we're thinking about Aboriginal exploration, if you've got, from my perspective, if you've got 
a, a group of people who've been in Australia for 60 to 100,000 years. They've been everywhere. They all over the country. They've they've developed to. They know the place inside out, upside down, back to front. Um, they've they've come to a, a state of sustainability within the environment. I've got my green hat on here. A whole level of sustainability, and then we're, then Europeans rock up in 1770, 1788, and change everything. So I think that might be a, a good lead into getting Jade up to have a bit of a ch chat about um, society and culture and, and his perspective on, on what some of this means in regards to what's in this exhibition, me raising the whole idea of, of um, Aboriginal explorers, and the fact that people such as myself want to say, look, Australia is not a young country, Prime Minister. It's a very, very old country. It's, our history goes back to that. You know, Aboriginal history is part of Australia's history. We are part of the land and, and you know, we are, it's part of our history. That, that we, we don't own or anything, but we need to recognise and, and take it on board and cherish it and, and be aware of it. So, Jade, I just put up two images, those earlier images saying that 25,000 years ago, the, 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 the water was miles, miles, 20 kilometres, 30 kilometres out of the coast. And that was one of the reasons why archaeologists have, for example, they've found uh, material at Sandon Point goes back 5,000 years. They've found material on the Blue Mountains 10,000 or so years. I read somewhere once that the, probably the oldest archaeological evidence um, for Aboriginal civilization on the East Coast is underwater. It, it's, out, it's out there because it's always seemed to me that obviously if someone's going to settle a place such as Australia, they're not going to first head off into the middle of the desert necessarily. The place is like the Aurora, where there's water and disease and fish and all that. Is The coast is where you're going to get a lot of settlement. And unfortunately, due to um, the rise and fall of sea levels to such an extreme degree, I mean, 100,000 years it was ago, it was about um, 40, 40 metres lower. As I said, 25,000 years, it was 85 metres lower than it is today. So a lot of that evidence is, is, is kind of not here with us at the moment. So that's enough for me. Did, Joe, do you want to get up and say a few words? Yeah, sure. <coughs> Thanks. Thanks for coming. Right. I must say, I didn't expect to be standing up in front of people today. I just uh, asked you fellas to take this on as I would as um, let's just do this blackfella style and, and find a way of uh, sharing and conversing in our, in our shared knowledge it's because we all live in this place and we all live with this place so it's important for us to all be able to share our stories and understandings of that. Before I sort of kick off and start um, my sort of articulation around these things it's uh, protocol I guess for me to just acknowledge country and acknowledge that this country is, as I'm saying here, a country of many stories over many, many thousands of generations. And it is through these stories and through what we call our outringa, which is essentially our dream, is the continuation of these stories. So we're, we're in a time and a place now where it's okay to acknowledge that and it's important for us to understand that. And before we can conduct any sharing of we should acknowledge our country because for us as a people in the way in which we engage with our environment our country is the ultimate our country is our mum and our country is our provider so for us to be able to speak about country for us to be able to speak about any knowledge or any business we, we do need to acknowledge that for me I think the distinction comes about when we, we speak about explorers, Aboriginal explorers, um, and the time before contact, so I guess pre-contact Australia, is that we have a situation when contact occurs and colonisation and settlement starts to occur, is you've got the bringing together of people that have entirely different worldviews. So you have an original people that are uh, existing in a way and living in a way with their environment that has a worldview at this polar end to a Western 
way of engaging with their environment and their lifestyle at this polar end. And that creates essentially what we have today. Uh, a big mess, really, because our value sets and our way of engaging with our world was entirely different. You've got to also recall that Australia is the youngest country that has been colonised. They've, the colonisers, if I, for lack of better words, have done this all before. They've been in other countries and they've been in other places and they've attempted and they've gone about things the way which they have. And we understand their stories of other Indigenous populations on, you know, on our earth. And I think the differentiation and the uniqueness of Australia is one in which it was, or sovereignty was claimed. So we have the proclamation of Terra Nullius. And that in itself articulates the differentiation of worldviews. Is that for us as a people, we cannot own the land. And that in itself creates a massive differentiation because we are consistently and constantly in relationship with our land. We have a custodial relationship with our place. And that is because we have an intimate, knowledgeable relationship with our place. And this comes about through exploration. Why is it that when I'm being grown up and my parents are being grown up, and their parents, and the list goes on all the way back to the old fella they called Padangarabin, who's followed the ships from the south coast to Sydney. And those stories, how is it that we know what trails to take? How is it that we know where to stop for water? How is it that we know what trees and plants and medicines and fruits and vegetables that we can use and utilise? How is it that we know these things? Because there's been exploration around them. The most significant aspect of our worldview is our country, what we call our nature, and our intimate relationship with it. The Illawarra for us, um, it was interesting for me when I came and done the work and there was a lady from the Mercury and she comes over to me and says, um, can you tell me some of the significant places around here? And I said, it's all significant. Every single tree, every single plant, waterways, the ocean, the animal life, the bird life, the sea life, every single aspect of that is significant. And she says again, but can you tell me the particular places that are significant? I said, no, it's all significant. Every single aspect of it. And so it's not that one person at one point in time explored it, it's that it's continually explored. It's like our dream. It's not the dream time, it's not set in time, it's continuous. It's continually engaged with and it's continually lived and experienced. As I've mentioned there, we have our stories. We have the story of Gang Man Gang, Wind Dang Island, and it speaks of a time when we came to this place, we brought the Dharawal, and it teaches our children, it teaches our middle-aged children, what we call them adolescents, it teaches our adults, it is our law, and that's part of our dream. But it gives us a context of how we came to be here, and how we came to engage and become in relationship with this place. It's it's a very different place pre-contact than the stories that we receive from a lot of the artworks and um, a lot of the history books because it's an entirely different framework in which we operate and exist and live in this land. I've used the word sustainability. Our worldview essentially centres itself around our relationship with. So our ability to sustain ourselves as a people you're thinking pre-contact, our lifestyle is generally hunter-gatherer. Um, it involves gathering food. It involves sustaining ourselves as people during the day. And it involves a high degree of discipline, law and ceremony. 
And within those aspects of our lifestyle, that means, again, that we have to have an intimate knowledge of our place and an intimate knowledge of our law. What we find um, through evidences that we do have is that it becomes very difficult for us when land grants are given. It's difficult for us when we start to find fences erected. You'll find that early conflict between white and Aboriginal people are generally around these things mm. because <coughs> we can't own land. And if there's a fence now that has a herd of sheep or cattle and these sorts of things are grazing on country, then our conceptualisation of the way in which we engage in the world is that this is here, this is on our country, this is everybody's, and this is how it operates. And you'll find there's recordings of misunderstandings around that where Aboriginal people begin to get what do we call it, punished, for lack of better words, for um, killing sheep, taking corn, uh, injuring cattle, um, essentially because what I'm saying to you, our worldviews are entirely different. We don't have the same concepts around ownership and we don't have the same value sets around the way in which we progress ourselves through our society. You've got a society of people that are valuing at the highest end knowledge. We don't have a monetary system. We had a bartering system, but essentially each Aboriginal person would have their own objects or tools. You had a society where there was men's and women's business. You had a society that was as close could be to a democracy that was obviously influenced by personality. But you had a situation where men and women didn't have those degrees of equality that separated them. It was about eldership, it was about knowledge, and it was about the way in which that could be articulated and shared throughout the communal group for the sustenance and sustainability of those people in relationship with their country. That is an entirely different world view to what begins to impose itself upon them and thereafter, you know, the ways in which that articulates itself is, I guess, partially what we have today. It's not an absolute utopia pre-contact and I think that's something that we fall into. And it's even easy for me to romanticise and say that we lived in the Garden of Eden and everybody got along and it was all happy days. There was personality. There was power struggles. We're quite lucky on the coast because it was a place of abundance. In my father's time, they tell stories of throwing three pomp aluminium spears over their shoulders into Mullet Creek to see how many fish they could catch. And they're catching fish. This is a place of abundance. What that essentially means is it can support a high population. And so you have a place where there are a number of clan groups that build themselves, and clan groups are essentially family groups. And you have small family groups that live a semi-nomadic life, I'd say. Um, we have particular camping sites that work for us. We are a people of efficiency. And I think that's what also goes um, unacknowledged upon first contact. You have the people of the time recording that Aboriginal people seemed lazy. It seemed like they weren't working. No, Aboriginal people have an intimate relationship with their country. They know when animals are going to feed water. Why chase a kangaroo around for three hours when you know at dusk he's going for a drink? Why go and swim for two hours when you know exactly where the abalone and the lobsters sit and where, and where, and how? And that's the point I'm trying to make. That intimate knowledge of our country, that exploration to sit within the framework of why we're here today, is the reason as to why we could efficiently live within our place, and with our place. And that's the crux of what, for me, this is about. It's the differentiation of those worldviews, and to present to you guys that there was a lifestyle and there was a continuing lifestyle, as Uncle said, that existed here for thousands of generations before it came to conflict with an entirely different worldview.
can you guys ask some questions to help me get out what I need to get out? Because I guess for me, um, it's hard to interpret what I've grown up to understand. Um, I'm quite privileged. Um, for those of you who don't have an understanding, my old man's Dutch, my mum's Kath. Um, I'm a five to 15 year old kid being dragged by the ear out into the escarpment and through the Royal National Park and this sort of area and told all of these sort of things like that tree does this and this does this and this story goes here and all of this sort of stuff and it was absolutely against my will at that point in my life. All I wanted to do was play football and Xbox. But I guess I got into my 20s and started to realise that um, there's a shift within our country. It's much more acceptable to be able to speak about these things. Um, it was hard for me because my dad's quite radical and so I grew up being denied the white history of Australia, so I'm not allowed to sing the national anthem in school. I'm not allowed to sit within history classes within school, and I'm taught to understand the black history. And this is the story. And it's stories of before they got here, you could walk from Wollongong to Sydney on the branches of fig trees. And just for me, that vision, you know, is something special for me today is to walk up to Mount Kira, look out, and shut my eyes and just disappear all the roads and buildings and just look over this country. We've got one of the most beautiful, for me I'm biased, absolutely, you know, this is my country. And for me it is the most beautiful place. It is where the escarpment on the mountains meet the ocean. It is a place of abundance and it is a place that gives us such a story that it just builds for me anyway. It builds my sense of belongingness up. It allows me to feel right where I am. Because this place has a story that goes beyond, like I think it's next year, that we get to celebrate 200 years of white settlement in the Illawarra. And it was interesting for me, I caught the bus down with the kids the other day um, to the basin, and on the way back into town, we walked through that park across from uh, St Mary's. I'm sorry, I don't know the name of the park, and in there I see a plaque, and it's Charles Throsby, the discoverer of the Illawarra. <laughs> and for me, it's Charles Throsby followed two blackfellas down what he now calls Throsby's track, which is all I pass. <coughs> this place was discovered, this place was lived with and within, and this place continues to be lived and lived within in our way to, to a large extent and to a, a lesser extent. It's, it's still there and our cultural understanding of this place still exists. Pre-contact though, it was a, a tribal life. You know, um, There's continual disagreement and worries about boundaries, but to give you guys a quick understanding, and this is my perspective and my raised understanding of my culture is that from the Hawkesbury River, right down to Malakur, just over the border of uh, Victoria there, you have the Yuan Kiti people. And within that nation, you have a number of dialects. And so you guys have probably heard the term Darawal, and you've probably heard the term Wadi Wadi, and a whole other range of terms, maybe Bong Bong. What you have across that span, from just over the border, up to the Hawkesbury River, sort of encaptured by the snowies and the escarpment, is one people. One people who all speak the same language. Within that you have subsets of people who speak different dialects of that language. Within those different dialects of people, you have subsets of tribal groups. Within the subsets of those tribal groups, you have clan groups. That's essentially our society and how it operates across our country. So a young man, I guess coming to adolescence or you know some sort of maturity and viewed by the community as coming to maturity, when he undergoes full initiation under UN law, it is his onus to walk across that entire country and have an understanding of each sacred site and ceremony that is attached to that sacred site and possibly the language that is associated with that site. 
in terms of the language. You were talking about Aboriginal people being fluent in seven, eight different languages. So their parent language, their dialects, particular family dialects, secret languages if they progress through their initiation correctly. You have a situation where these people have an absolute intimate knowledge of a massive expanse of country. And that society, like I was saying to you before, does not differentiate between men and women because I think it goes, it's difficult, you know, early anthropologists are generally men. And because of our way of men's and women's business, we don't have a lot of records in relations to women's initiation and women's business, I guess. We have a lot of recording around men. But our women were initiated. Um, one of the common knowledges and understandings of this area is our women would have part of their small finger removed as part of the initiation. That generally came about because of, I'm telling you how awesomely civilised and efficient we are, that little finger would get in the way for these women fishing. And so one of the women's objects was fishing line and fishing hooks. And, and I guess what that means is for men, for us to fish, we would fish with spears. And that was our objects and that wasn't something that women could touch. And for men, we couldn't touch the fishing line and fishing hooks. And they would fish with line. And I think the pinky would get in the way. And so when women were old enough to be able to contribute to their group, they would be initiated through that sense. Then they also undergone, or underwent, no apologies, other forms of initiation. Um, in some areas it's understood that it's quite ghastly, but what you'll find is, because we generally got around generally naked, and the way in which our skin would heal with that sort of bubbling, is there, a, there is a term for it, and I apologise for it, but if you guys have seen the, the scarring that's occurred, uh, within some photos and that, they were signifiers. They were signifiers for Aboriginal people to be able to understand who an individual was, what status an Aboriginal person had within that group or within that society at that time, and how far their knowledge had taken them to that point. Because your progression from childhood to adulthood is a progression of knowledge. Anything in particular I'm not hearing here for you? No, it's amazing. I think it's... it's I guess it's hard for me, guys, because when you, you grow up, understanding things, I don't know how to share what it is that you guys might need to know. Is there any questions that might be relevant for you guys if we're taking ourselves back to a time pre-contact? Thank you. I'd like to know how important the marine life was as a food source in comparison to the sorts of foods that you could get on land. I mean, was it a major food source on this coast? Absolutely. Uh, and also the shellfish. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So we're essentially referred to as a saltwater people, but when we speak of Yuan and Darawal and Duraga and these sorts of language groups that sit with on the coastline here, they do refer to us as saltwater, freshwater and bitter water people. So we will be living in the escarpment, we will be living in between where it is bitter, and we'll be living on the, the coast. Fishing was probably the most extensive food source. Um, there's still stories within my father's lifetime of being able to walk ankle deep into the water and find abalone. Today, that's near impossible to be able to walk ankle deep anyway, but it's near impossible to find abalone at times, unless you're Corey and Melbourne they are. But um, absolutely, seafood and sea life was a major part of our lives and centred around that. The lake absolutely was utilised, you know, and it just doesn't look, or it didn't look like it does today, obviously. Um, absolutely utilised canoes, um, fishing by fire at night. Um, lots of stories of how canoes were made, and lots of stories how we used to use clay and coal to light ourselves for fishing at night. So it was not the absolute centre, but of our lifestyles pre-contact was centred around fishing on the water, diving and collecting seafood and sea life. You've got to remember the shells utilised for hooks and other ceremonial aspects or adornment. So a lot of people use shells, teeth, skins and things to adorn themselves, feathers even. Um, but yeah, it's, it's still, it's hard because you're talking about a society that, you know, you've got this influx now of 
a dominant culture that comes in and it says this is the way it operates now. And for us, we're all taught to dive uh, growing up. We're all taught to dive and fish because it's us basing ourselves. You know, I've, I come from you know, my grandparents that are sort of fringe dwellers. You know, we're talking the pre-67 days. We don't qualify for anything, um, you know, in terms of housing or social security. We can't get a job. So you've got um, the population of sort of the south coast. They're constantly transitioning between Eden and Lapa. They're, they're, they're transitioning over their country and they're looking for work. And generally that work that will be provided to them is things like picking fruit and vegetables or working in sawmills. And the way in which they are sustaining themselves is through diving and fishing a lot of the time. So we benefit from that to some extent, but obviously it can be to our detriment. For, I've, I've just had an uncle locked up for five years for diving for abalone. Mm -hmm. Where for me, for a very long time, it's sort of slowed down now, I'm getting a bit white, but maybe five years ago, I was diving twice a week to help sustain my family here, that were living in my home because that's what we grew up doing. I still wander up the mountain and collect bush medicine because that's what we were growing up doing. Um, so there's lots of people that are still engaging in it, but absolutely it was the centre of our lifestyle to an extent. Like Does that make sense? Sweet. You spoke about <clears throat> how a young man, when he comes into sort of more towards adulthood would be obliged to basically walk the whole country. Would that be a loan? It's not a, it's not a buy, oh, it's but. actually law. And I'm probably articulating myself a little bit all over the shop, but it helps me clarify some yeah. things. But. So would he do that alone? Absolutely not. Um, you and law was a seven year term. There was a year of that where men would be taken away from their general group and they would be put in together and they would undertake that law together. They're, for that first initial year, they couldn't speak to anyone other than the people that they were with. They couldn't look at anybody. Um, and they would only converse and stay within their own camps as they were travelling, converting, <coughs> commuting throughout that progression. And that's when you start to see the scarring and the tooth knocked. And I guess for Aboriginal Australia, I think we, you know, I think us within the room probably comprehend it, but we're talking about a continent of many countries. So you've got something like over 400 different countries on this continent. There's a lot of same-sames that occur across the continent. And so our understanding of country and our world view across the entire continent is the same. Our hierarchy and the way in which we progress through that hierarchy is the same. The differentiator for us as peoples from different countries across this continent is our geography and our environment. So, you know, you've got desert people, you've got rainforest people, and you've got salt water, fresh water, bitter water people. And so your law would be associated, obviously, with your environment, because our significant size, like I was saying to you before, you go up the top of Mount Kiri, you close your eyes, you disappear all of the man, white, white, excuse my language, but give me hey, just be with me, your white man-made stuff, and you look at it and you go, absolutely, that's got to be significant. There's islands in that lake. There's islands out off our shoreline. There's an escarpment that does this. And you can start to see what becomes significant to us based on our way of understanding and being in an intimate relationship with our place. So obviously the significant sites and significant places of significant change with geography and place, and the way in which you would transition through them would be different but the general progression through that law is the same. The scarring or the initiation rights or the display upon Aboriginal people's person would be different, but those countries that are in close proximity, you would not only understand each other's language, but you would also understand the markings and what that means. Does that help? Hi. Thanks very much for all this. Could you say something about the status of languages in the Illawarra? The status of languages at this point in time in the yeah. Illawarra? Uh, yeah. What, what remains? What's being rediscovered? Um, there's been, over the last, say, 10 years, a lot of work put into um, regenerating and relearning lots of language. Um, essentially, 
Aboriginal, Aboriginal people across the entire country are first contact people, but we mob on this coast are the first of the first. Mm. And what you have is a situation within that first 10 years is a massive sort of desecration of our way of life. And what we're talking about is the Sydney people, Gadigal, Bidigal, those sorts of people are our cousins and our brothers and our sisters in terms of the Dharawal speaking group. So you've got the wiping out of Sydney within 10 years. Gone. And you do have, to some extent, you've got to remember, we understand their language. You see, so tribally, I don't know if I've articulated that network very well, and I apologise if I haven't, but tribally my mob, my mob come from, say, Wallaga Lake, Naruma, Marie. By the time settlement and colonisation hits my mob, we're walking towards Victoria. And so some people chose to walk and impose themselves upon other communities and mobs and people, and some chose to resist. I don't know if you guys have heard of people such as Pemawai and Tedbury, and there's other, for us, I guess, heroes of resilience and <laughs> resistance. But um, there's, a, there's a situation going on where all of our knowledge is essentially encapsulated within our elders. And if you lose that line of people like that in a number of years, then we lose a lot of knowledge. And so the way in which we've started to establish our languages is we've essentially taken the concept that Australia as a continent has one language and 400 different dialects. And so from what we do know and what we have been able to keep, um, because lots of lingo is still being sort of used in a pidgin type sense, um, but it's not a fluent language by any means. Uh, we've started to work with close networks and other close countries and communities to rebuild that. So at this point in time, I wouldn't say you have an entirely fluent language but you do have a vocabulary of up to about 300 to 400 words with joining words. And that was the really important part for us because a lot of our elders knew words for this and that and particular objects, but we didn't comprehend the structure of our language and the joining words, I guess. I don't know the particular linguistic terms for them, but that's, that's getting to that point. And so I'm, I've been part of a project that's been looking at that. So Maybe another few years. I'll come in here speaking black or two. Have you able to share um, a bit about a whale cave up on the escarpment, or what we call whale cave? Mount Kembla? Yeah, um, in Cordo, past Mount Kembla. Yeah. Um, I don't know how to negotiate that one very well. It's really hard for me. Um, I was raised in a time and a place where I was told not to speak about anything, but what starts to conflict with me is then I start hearing people speak about it. And so for you guys, it must be extremely confusing because it is for me. Like I'm sitting in meetings with Aboriginal people and I'm hearing them speak about certain things. You know, I'm talking Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people and they're speaking about things and I'm going, all of my life I've been told not to speak about this but now we are speaking about it. And I don't think there's been any true consensus within our community about how to approach those things. Mm -hmm. So can I just respectfully say, for me to just stay true to myself, because I rip the people who are talking about it at the moment, just for me to respectfully go where that is. See, it's not as easy as, say, the story of Mount Kira, or the story of Gang Man Gang, where there are if we can understand the way in which our dreaming operates, our dreaming is connected to our law. And so for us, the our dreaming works in that way, is that when a kid is this high, you know, we go this story. And when a kid is this high, we go, now it's this story. And when a kid is this high, we're now saying, well, the bottom of Mount Kira, that's a women's place there, and that's why the white bottom rice has turned red. Because now you are enough. Know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And within all of those stories, there's absolute markers and ways for us to engage within our protocol and our understanding of life. 
for me in the story that I understand of that place, I don't have that story. So I don't have a lot. Do you know what, does that make sense to people? I don't know if I am, I'm sorry. Does that sort of make sense? So I don't have the story that we can just generally go, this is what it means. And, you know, a whale, you know, chased a whole other bunch of animals and they came this way because, you know, he was possessive and greedy and, you know, and, blah, 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 and it's just a nice little fairy tale to some extent, you know. But is that site a saltwater site? Saltwater people, or would it be a freshwater or a bit of water people? Like it's where it, where it is. No, absolutely, and I'm sorry if I've articulated it wrong. So we 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 move around our country, yep. in what I was sort of referring to as a semi nomadic way. Really, we move across our country seasonally, and we know, like I said, we have an intimate relationship with our environment. So we know when the Sally blossoms, Sally what will me, right? Lobsters are running. We know that today, you know? We know when we see certain plants and what they're doing and how they're flowering, it's like my little rain, you know? Now, now we go here. And so we had places that we would go to because it was easy. That's where everything was. And so to find sea life depictions within the escarpment, well, it's the same model, it's the same people. You know, and they talk about finding totemic pictures that are apparently associated with people from Bateman's Bay in the Royal National Park here, which is virtually Sydney. And I think the confusion is because we've had these sort of imposed borders mm -hmm. and imposed languages and it's the same people. Mm -hmm. You know, like my mob might have tribally originated out of Wallaga and Tilba Tilba and that sort of edging on the Monero area, right? But I'm still on country. This is still my country. And if I undertook the law of that time, I would have walked through here and understood every ceremonial site and would have known where every bore of ground was and every other significant site. And I would have had to walk past that depiction and understand what it was and how I was to dress and how I was to walk in and what ceremony I had to perform. Although I would have lived the majority of my day in that place. This is still my country. And I think we get confused about that sort of framework. <coughs> is that, you know, we have borders and languages and all these sorts of things imposed on us and that creates confusion for a lot of Aboriginal people because of all the dispossession and displacement that's occurred. But I guess I'm quite privileged. My family have stayed on country. Um, I don't have huge stories of stolen people within our families. They were generally living on the fringes throughout that era in those times. So. For me, I'm quite lucky to have access to these sorts of things here. Yeah. Jade, um, so as you said, being Dutch's son, you've had that connection. So what about people who are trying to reconnect? How? It's a hard story. Yeah. It's a hard story. Um, because it's of no fault of the individuals as to the predicament they find themselves in. So we do, we've got a generation of people who've been deliberately removed from their place. You, you think about our world view, and, and I've started to articulate it like this. We have our country and our intimate relationship with our country, our mum. We have our kin and our kinship, and so that is how we identify ourselves. You see every black one, you know, like, what's your name, where are you from? So we identify, it sounds selfish, but it's actually our communal way and internalisation of how we fit. So everybody is in relation to me. And how do I fit within this network of people? Because these people make me who I am, all right? So I've got my country, I've got my kin, I've got my culture. And so my culture is my daily lived expression with my people and my place. Right, so my culture is a human culture. My culture is not Pitmanjaro culture. My culture is not Wongai culture or Yolongu culture. My culture is the first of the first contact. My culture is missionisation, institutionalisation. It's bean picking and sawmills. It's living on the mission. Can we even miss at La Brousse? That is my culture, right? And it is my expression, but that is not the same culture as a Yolongu man, right? 
And then we have our journey. And the way in which we articulate our journey is um, it's our lived experiences. And so the thing for Blackfellas and the way in which we view the world is they're not only my lived experience, so what are those really significant things that have happened in our lives that connect us to our day to day, to our people, and to our place? Right? And so for me, it's not just my lived experience, but it's my parents' lived experience and my grandparents' lived experience. That's how our dreaming operates in our stories, right? It's that they're continuous. There's no Captain Cook set out on this date mm. and then land me on this date. It's, it's continuous, right? So all of those stories connect with the way I live my daily life, with the people that I live with it, and my place. And the connectedness of that is that interrelationship. And what you have is a really clever strategy of government at that time to remove Aboriginal people from their country, their people, their lived day to day, and their lived experiences that are also by proxy their entire family and communities, right? So I pick this fella up over here and I go, all right, you're a black fella from Jerks Bay, right? And New South Wales essentially operated like this. You had Cootamundra, you had Kinchla, and you had Bombardary Children's Home. And so the way the government operated it in this state was, if you were a child under five, you went to Bombardary. If you were a boy, you went to Kinshaw, if you were a girl, you went to Cootamundra, right? And so I pick you up from Jervis Bay, right, young fella, for example, and I shift you up here to a different country with different people, away from a different cultural understanding of your life and away from all of your stories, all of your lived experience here and all of the lived experiences fed to you through your family, right? And I shove you in a place, an institution, with black fellas from all over the place. And I say, look at you, Mob, you're from different countries, so this is your place here now. And you've all got different kin, and you just can't understand each other. So here you go, he's English, he's speaking English now. And you've all got different spiritualities, because your spirituality is connected to your place. You see, that's my grandmother there, that's my grandfather there. And that's how it operates, right? All of my significant places are attached to where I'm from. So here's Christianity, and you do this now, and you don't speak your language, and you don't practice your culture, you speak English now. And it's not just for black fellas, it was a sign of the times, the discipline was different, and the way in which we operated within that was different. And from that instance, you essentially build it out. You get to a certain age, and then, I don't know, a lot of the fellas out west end up working in stock, you know, and on the stations, and. You have a lot of stories of women being put into the centre of Sydney and they're working as housemaids. And there were certain times where this was just expected. You were given your board, you were given a uniform to wear, and you were fed, essentially. And so it sort of gets untold, but we don't even talk about the fact that slavery existed in this country because it was not essentially shackles and chains. It was, you come through this institution and now you essentially work for free. You know, and what occurred thereafter is, you know, there used to be a lot of word amongst black fellas, it's like, go to Redford and find your family. You know, and mm. you have a situation where, I know a story of one old auntie, she got shipped from <coughs> Cootamundra out to Hay. She worked for the McDonald's and um, I don't mean to appropriate a story if I'm just glossing over it really quickly or disrespect her in any way, but she ends up falling pregnant to the station master. The wife obviously takes offence to that. She has two kids. She gets passed on over the border to an Ujura <coughs> to another family because obviously the wife can't do this anymore. Her last name changes. Her last name changes with that move into the property that she's now working on. All right. She's stuck there now, and when she passes away, her kids take about 10 years to try and find where they come from. She's got to remember, she was taken from the South Coast, sent to Kurtamundra, sent to Hay. All she's got is her two kids. She gets sent from Hay to Mildura, and then when the kids are trying to find their family, they go, on. it's hard for them because they haven't shared the journey 
with the mob who didn't get taken. And so those poor people find themselves in a real hard situation because they've not grown up with their mob, they've not grown up with their understanding of who their kin are, they've not grown up on country, they've not grown up understanding their nuances of their culture, you know, and they've not got that shared understanding of the experiences of their people, right? So they're disconnected from their mob, but they're also in isolation and disconnection over here because they're essentially foster kids, you know? And so there's a resistance from our communities <coughs> because it takes time for them to be able to come back in. There's a lot of healing that needs to occur, but am I making myself clear? Mm -hmm. Just how it sort of operates, you know, it's really hard because mm -hmm. you think about our worldview that I was trying to explain to you if I was pre-contact, mm -hmm. It all was centred around our place and our relationships with each other and that place. So it was a very good strategy mm -hmm. for a land grab. We knew from the time of Cook, from the time of Arthur Phillip, that there was a civilization here that wasn't like us, that we didn't want to know about. And so these things just didn't happen. And people say, oh, no, we don't say sorry or anything like that. We, we didn't know anything about this. In 1816, Governor Macquarie said he wanted five, he wanted children, he wanted five um, Aboriginal, good-looking Aboriginal children for his school in Sydney. Take the children away, don't worry about it. So we knew about all this. We, we meaningfully imposed this upon Aboriginal society. And I think that's very important because it's easy to hear that and go, oh no, well no one knew about any of this. That... It was government policy. And yeah, and the other thing was we never really took the effort and we still haven't made the effort to really try and understand. A lot of what Jade's saying here, I, I still don't understand. It's a completely different worldview, a completely different civilization. Perhaps we will never understand. Until we accept that we may never understand, we can never, I, I don't think we're going to get anywhere by saying, oh, we know what to do now, because we don't. No, I hope Rose raises a good point, um, because it is a differentiation between the way in which we view the world like. I say it because I teach a lot in the schools and um, it's hard, like I was telling you before the way in which we tell our stories, right? Um, if I've got a cool kid and they come up to me and go, hey, what's that then? I say, don't worry about it, you don't need to know. There's an instant understood acceptance of that. And I don't mean, I'm not being disrespectful, if a white kid comes along and you go, oh, what's that? And you go, no, they don't worry, no. And they'll go, why? Why not? What? There is an acceptability because of the innate understanding of our culture and the way we are is that it's okay not to know. And it's okay to be told because our absolute, like I said before, our economy was based on knowledge. And so when you were to know something, then you were granted that knowledge. When you were seen by your community to be in a position to understand and accept that knowledge, then you were shared that.